tie up a real good warm water nymph here. This is the Clouser Swimming Nymph. Works also well in cold water climates and smaller sizes, but a number of years ago, Bob Clouser came out with a book called Clouser Flies. Not certain how much you'll get in here in the video, but I'll put a picture of it in the and a link in the description down below. This is, if you're into smallmouth fishing and smallmouth flies, that is one book I highly recommend in terms of flies that are great for smallmouth. Now, this particular fly is excellent. It can be fished as a streamer, and also be uh, fished as a nymph, whether you're high sticking or fishing under an indicator, or you could even fish this as a dropper, say behind uh, even a popper or a, uh, a grasshopper imitation or a Chernobyl ant or something like that. But it's just all around a very, very effective fly. That's the Clouser Swimming Nymph. I'll get started. So before I start uh, the Clouser Swimming Nymph and put my hook in the vise, I'm actually going to place this gold bead on the hook. I've never done this before. There's a large hole on one side, a small hole on the other. The point of the hook goes in the small hole. That allows it to come around the barb of the hook and then slide right up to the eye. Now if you're debarbing the hook, you could probably go with a little bit smaller bead. It would still get around the where the barb's at in the bend of the hook. This is a Mustad R74 9672 is the original nomenclature in a size six. For smallmouth, I like these in a little bit larger size in a size six. But if you're just going to be fishing these for trout, you could certainly do these in some eights and tens. I'm going to put some lead on the hook shank. This is a 0 0.25 lead free. I want to put about 15 wraps on the hook shank. I'm going to smooth those off, those tag ends. Then I'm going to push all of those lead wraps right into that large opening in the back of that bead. It's just going to help to hold it right up against the eye of the hook. I'm going to put a little wax on my thread. This is just to help me grip the hook shank and some materials as I'm tying this in. For thread, I'm using a UTC 140 denier in a brown. And that's just to match the body of this particular fly. You can do this in an olive or a black or uh, other colors of burnt orange. I'm going to attach my thread behind those lead wraps and proceed to make a little bit of a thread dam and that's just to give me a nice transition as i am dubbing up the body on this i'll go ahead and put a few wraps of thread crisscrossing over that let those lead wraps just to hold them in place and bring my thread all the way down to the end of the hook shank here i'm going to tie in the tail the tail is made up of brown marabou and some copper flashaboo. I'm actually using a holographic copper flashaboo. I like the color and flash of that a little bit better than the regular flashaboo. I'm going to take two marabou feathers, but I'm going to tie these in separate. So I'm going to take the one marabou feather that I have, removing some of the fluff here. I'm going to tie this in on the hook shank, I want a tail that's 
the book says t two times as long as the hook shank, but because this is a little bit long, I'm only going to go about one and a half times the hook shank. And secure this down, wrapping up just a little bit to secure. Gives me a nice transition also in terms of my diameter, bringing the tail end of that hook shank up to about the same diameter as the lead. But I do this because now I'm going to tie in the flashaboo. The easiest way to do this flashaboo, just cut off two or three strands, bring them right up underneath the thread. I like to tie them in on the sides. You could just tie them right in on the top if you want. Then I'm going to pull these down just a little bit beyond the tail. I'll take a few wraps going up the hook shank and then coming back down to my original tie in spot. Then I'm going to fold the flash boot over to the other side and tie it in right down along the other side of the hook shank. And then I'm going to trim that. It's a little bit longer than the marabou. What that does for me is that flashaboo will stick out beyond the ends of the marabou and it will flutter and flash beyond that tail. And it has much more uh, of an ability to attract, catch the eye of the fish. You take my second marabou going to measure it the same as the first and tie it in. I suppose these are kind of thin, these two marabous that I just tied in. I could probably tie those in the same, but it's up to you. Securing all that down, I'm now ready for my dubbing. Now here I'm just going to use a direct dubbing technique where I'm just going to twist the dubbing onto the, to the uh, thread. For dubbing, I'm using a dark brown squirrel dubbing. Give you a little tip here. A lot of people, when they do this kind of direct dubbing where you're twisting it onto the thread, they'll put the, the wax on the thread. You don't want to do that for a couple of reasons. Where the wax really needs to go is on your finger. So if you take your index finger, just rub it over the wax a little bit, smear that over to your thumb. What this does is first off it allows you to get more grip on the dubbing as you are putting it onto the thread. If you just have your bare fingers, especially this time of year when humidity is low and hands are dry, they tend to slide over a lot of different dubbings. So the wax will give you a little grip there. The second is you'll notice I'm twisting this on, but I'm away from the point of the hook. A lot of people try to get in real close like this and they're stabbing their finger with the point of the hook. What you can do is do your dubbing a little bit away from the, the hook where it's more comfortable and then just slide it up to the fly like that. If I put the wax on the thread, I can't do that. The wax will keep a grip on it and the whole noodle starts to get broken up if I try to do that. So just a tip, remember, the best place for the wax in this type of dubbing is on your fingers. If you have to, get a little bit more. I'm going to make about a three inch, fairly thin dubbing noodle here. It's not that thick. This is going to be the abdomen portion. And this squirrel is a short kind of fiber, so you're not going to get it really, really thick anyway. If you have to, we can always put on multiple layers. So starting right at the base of the body and the tail, I'm going to just advance my dubbing forward. Like I said, see, I can wrap over a little bit, do an extra layer there to get that a little thicker, and then make another noodle. I want to dub right up to the back of those lead wraps. Obviously, if you're tying this on a smaller hook, you're going to make this even a little bit thinner. You're trying to keep the body proportion to the hook size and the overall bug size. A 
I go back down a little bit just to fill that in, bring my thread, I'll put just a little bit more. Direct dubbing is, takes a long time to really kind of get this down in terms of dubbing this and getting the right shape body first out. A long time ago, I just started looking at this in terms of layers. And if I have to, I can go back down the body a little bit to put a little bit more on and get the layer, I should say, the taper that I'm looking for by adding in more layers of dubbing. See, I've got a gradual taper as I come up here. Then I'm right at the back of those lead wraps. I like the squirrel because it has all this buggy stuff that sticks out of the body. Next step is to tie in the wing case, which is made of peacock curl. I'm going to select about 15, maybe 20 peacock curl strands like this, and I'm going to try and get the tips fairly close. They don't have to be. The reason I'm tying these in by the tips is I'll show you in just a moment. But I'm going to cut all of those so they're nice and even. And I'm going to tie and secure those in right up against that dubbing. Then we're going to tie in our hackle. The hackle, which is basically going to represent kind of legs on our nymph. I'm using a uh, dyed brown grizzly hen hackle. You can use, I think the recipe calls for a speckled hen. The speckled hen that I have is just not that long for especially this size hook. For a smaller hook, it might work, but I'm going to have to get a number of wraps of this hackle in. And I like to have, especially fishing this for smallmouth, I like to have more legs in there than say, a smaller trout nymph. I'm going to isolate the tip of that feather like this. Trim off everything except for a little triangle that I can secure down to the hook shank. My thread should end up right back at the end of what will be the thorax area, but right up against the abdomen. Like a lot of these flies, if you want these bigger size flies, throw a little glue on at different steps just to help secure that a little bit more. And then we're going back to our dubbing. Because I want the thorax to be a little bit thicker, I'm definitely going to be putting on two layers of dubbing here. Again, I find it's just easier if you're not comfortable or used to this particular technique or the materials that you're using. I just find it's a lot easier to just do a, a sparse, longer dubbing noodle that you can add different layers kind of back and forth to get the taper that you're looking for on the body. The squirrel is nice stuff, but it's very, very short fibered, so it sometimes just doesn't go on really nice and smooth. It ends up kind of clumping a little bit. Really good stuff for real small nymphs, but I like the color on this. This brown is a nice, dark brown is a nice color. So I'm going to start wrapping, and I want to make certain I'm wrapping right up against that abdomen. Notice I'm just going forward, not quite directly behind the bead, then coming back again. Then I'm going to put a little bit more dubbing on, and all I'm doing is keeping that taper. Now, if you don't want to mess with the taper on this, and you just want to, it's easier to do it with a level body, then by all means, go right ahead.
Now I've got just a slight gap right back here behind the eye of the hook. The reason for that is I have the hackle to tie in as well as the peacock curl. It's just not even half an eye length. I'm going to take that hackle, trying to fold the barbs back a little bit just kind of helps. I'm going to get one wrap right where it's tied in, and then as I come around top, I'll start to open that up, palmer that in in about three wraps. Another reason for a little bit longer feather. About three wraps in here, and whoop, popped out of my hackle pliers. Plus, this particular nymph is, did it again. Might be time for some new hackle pliers. This particular nymph does real well with these really, really long barbs on it. I'll bring that last wrap in that little area there. Come around two or three times, securing that in and just trimming off the excess. You look at in that book that I mentioned, The Clouds or Flies, he likes to have nice long barbs on these. It really kind of looks out of proportion because his tail is even a little bit longer than mine, but uh, it works. That's all I can say, it's a good fly. So now I'll take, I want to collect the peacock curls here. The reason why I tied these in by the tip was twofold. One, tips are going to be narrower, so when I tie them down here, they're not going to bulk up as much. Two, I kind of want to spread these out as I bring these forward. Notice I'm moistening my fingers and I'm just stroking those barbs down and out of the way. I'm going to bring this forward, but when I do, I want to kind of flatten it out. It's easier for me to just push down and kind of let that spread out a little bit by tying that in by the tips than it is if I do it by the stiffer butt sections. Holding that in place, I'm just going to wrap over the very top. I'm going to get three or four nice tight wraps in there so that I have just a nice broad wing case. And then you want to trim these. But I'm not going to trim these right down to the thread. I'm actually just going to kind of come across the top of the bead here and just trim these straight across that way. That just leaves this little nub right here, which I think has a little bit more of a traction to it. It adds a little bit to it. Maybe wrong. And not that I think if you did clip that off right next to the thread, that it would uh, diminish the effectiveness too terribly, but or at all. Then I'm going to put a four turn whip finish right on those thread wraps. Trim away my thread. Some head cement. And the Clouser Swimming Nymph is done. There we go. So as you can see, this is a real buggy looking fly. I mean, these legs are gonna go all over the place, as well as the marabou tail. It's got the flash in it. Um, it is just a, quite the attractor in the water. Similar to Harry Murray's strength, the, these can be fished under a strike indicator if you want. So very much as a nymph or swing these things. I've had real good luck just letting them swing in the current. Good colors for this are the brown, olive, black, even kind of a burnt orange. I mean, if you're trying to go for maybe imitating a crawdad or something, or you could even put a little burnt orange in the body, I think here, maybe for the thorax, just to add a little attraction to it. But that is the Clouser Swimming Nymph. Thanks for watching today.
Thanks for joining me at Device today. I hope you learned at least a new pattern, if not a new technique, maybe a tip or trick here and there. If you have any questions about this fly or any of the techniques used in constructing this pattern, please leave them in the comments section down below. If you go to the trouble to ask a question, I'll go to the trouble to answer it. If you'd like to help dressed irons, please share this video with your friends and anybody you think that might enjoy this pattern. Until next time, remember, it's fly tying. If you're not having fun, then you're doing it wrong.